Castle. Cut it. Everyone trying to get somewhere. Yet, on either side of these swarming highways, a stretch of English country in which to linger. A place out of this modern world where the simple pleasures are enough. And for once, you can call your soul your own. This is the new forest in Hampshire, sometimes called a miraculous survival of pre-Norman England. Tall trees, wandering streams, open heathland. The forest ringed round by townships bound up with Hampshire's history. Limington, its Georgian elegance undimmed. At the edge of Southampton water, high, quaintly bow window. To the west, Ringwood, lively on market days. And Fording Bridge on the River Avon. For a few hundred yards, the Avon itself a forest boundary. Its valley hardly changed since the conqueror hereabouts marked out his royal hunting ground. And the Saxon locals named it the New Forest. Unchanged too, a spectacle which has long rejoiced the hunters. Today's descendants of the deer, which once were royal quarry. Nor can the habits of the roguish Brock, who gave his name to Brockenhurst, have altered in all these years. Everything, in fact, is much as it always was. That, indeed, is the essence of the forest, its changelessness, the miraculous survival. And we may believe that its people, old and young, their roots set in the Hampshire soil firmly as those of the very trees, continue a way of life little disturbed through the centuries. At this spot, William Rufus was killed by an arrow. Just a stone recalls a slain king while the memory of his slayer is enshrined in a pub. All over the forest, you find links with the past, whether the gaunt relic known these 200 years as the naked man, or the ancient but still flourishing nightwood oak, which, tradition at least insists, was a sapling when Coeur de Leon went off to the Crusades. At Lyndhurst, capital of the new forest, history again. For here is the queen's house, Early Tudor, and within its walls, the courtroom of the forest verderers, where the ancient forest laws and rights are still administered. When the court is not sitting, visitors pause to whet their antiquarian appetites. From the Queen's house, in the shadow of Lyndhurst's modern parish church, to village churches steeped in the past. Brockenhurst, mentioned in the Doomsday Book, and also to be found in the Doomsday Book, Minstead. But it is at Beulah, its neat houses of mellow brick, that you come upon the most precious of the forest's ecclesiastical treasures, the lovely ruins of Beulah Abbey. Time has softened the scars of Beulah's destruction, and today it is again for many a place of pilgrimage. Close by, and formerly the main gatehouse to the abbey, Palace House. Now one of England's stately homes. Here too, visitors are welcome. For like many another stately home today, Palace House Beulah thus helps to earn its keep. A museum within a museum, veteran cars.
trophies from the forest. And a reminder that at Buckler's Hard, not far away, were built those wooden walls which saved us in Napoleon's time, among them Nelson's Agamemnon. Go to Buckler's Hard today on Beaulieu River and you step back a couple of centuries. In these unspoilt houses lived the shipbuilders. Their raw materials, the great oaks, hauled from the forest. Widely separated the two rows of houses so that the oaks could be rolled down between them to the river's edge. There, one after another, the vessels took shape and sailed away to war. Today, the new forest provides timber, perhaps for more prosaic, but for no less vital purposes. This is the responsibility of the Forestry Commission, the maintenance of forest lands throughout the country, assurance of homegrown timber supplies. In the new forest, oak, beech, ash, and conifers, larch, fir, spruce, pine. Farmers' crops come to maturity in a matter of months, not so the foresters. Theirs may take up to 150 years, so that seldom within a lifetime can they expect to see the full results of their labors. Time was when trees grew haphazard. Since then, science has stepped in, and today they are grown with an eye to preserving the countryside, backed by precise knowledge of the conditions in which they will best flourish. Natural regeneration is also encouraged, as you see here. Periodic examination, measuring girth and height, thinning so that the remaining trees grow straight and unencumbered. When the trees are mature, the axe and the saw, to most of us inevitably a rather painful sight. Yet, not one rarely to deplore, for the forest itself is being constantly renewed, and timber we must have. Timber for pit props, for telegraph poles, for railway wagons, for scaffolding and ladders. Timber for the construction of our homes, from window frames to roofing, for furniture. Anonymously, inconspicuously, the perpetual harvests of the new forest are distributed over the land. Only when trees die do they begin their second, more useful life. During both world wars, the forest supplied many million cubic feet of timber. This is a survivor of over 20 wartime sawmills. Various forest handicrafts have evolved from all this traffic in timber. The manufacture of fencing and gates of the traditional English design. Broom making, mostly from heather or light branches of the birch. and brooms of another type. Their use peculiar to heath and forest land, fire brooms. In the dry months, fire is a constant danger. From tall towers, linked by telephone with brigade headquarters, continual watch is kept for the first signs of rising smoke and flame. In come the firefighters, at first the farming and village people nearest the blaze, well knowing that whole acres and perhaps their very homes could soon be devastated. 
How did it start? Perhaps a smoker throwing away a burning match. Picnickers, perhaps, careless with a stove. At any rate, let this be a warning to them. Farming. In forest country, of necessity, not on a great scale. A matter of small holdings. But flourishing where the open stretches of land allow. Here, one of various pedigree herds. Modernity and up-to-date methods pursued at this model farm. Such valuable beasts must be confined, and especially the bulls. But observe the number of animals permitted to wander at large in the forest. Not merely permitted, but there by right. The right of mast, for instance, fallen acorns and beech nuts for pigs in the autumn. And the right of pasturage for cattle. Forest rights, these, still enjoyed by the commoners, those occupiers of land and owners of livestock, whose Saxon ancestors were granted these privileges 900 years ago. Where livestock are concerned, there the Agisters will be found. The Agisters, there are four of them, are the mobile representatives of the Verderers, the smallest police force in the world, they've been called. Still in their 18th century uniform, they uphold the commoners' rights and see that the forest laws are observed. Among their duties, tracing lost animals or the owners of animals which have strayed and been impounded. From time to time, owners and agisters round up the cattle, not exactly Wild West cowboys as we know them, yet doing much the same job. rounded up for the markets and for the checking of brands. So that each agister can recognize the cattle which belong to his particular area, tails are clipped in a distinguishing fashion. But of all the animals which wander at large, the new forest ponies are most decidedly part of the landscape. Hard to imagine the forest without them. Up to 1,200 of them roam around. Wild, you may say, yet completely tame, especially at times like these. A happy but unusual event, pony twins. The ponies' demanding ways are shared by the few forest donkeys, also free to wander. Wandering hoofs on high roads and in high streets, especially in warm weather when ponies are glad to get away from the forest flies. Also, it's supposed, they like to cool their noses against the glass of shop windows. Though they wander far, all new forest ponies are in fact bought and owned, and seasonal roundups take place. So the owners check on their property and prepare the ponies for the sales which are regularly held. Hey, 
18, 18 bad, at 18 get it. At 18, and I'm telling us over 18. Hold on. And the bar is. A pony sale draws the countryside. Owners and prospective buyers, and those who just like to look on. At one time, most ponies were destined for the pits, but no longer now. Nowadays, many of them find such useful careers as pulling light delivery vans. But the best of them go off to riding schools, especially for the instruction of young people. 23, 23, get it on a bit far now. 23, get it on a bit far now. So for 23, I'll let him out at 23. Too late, sir. It is on the best of the forest ponies, we said, that young people are taught to ride. And here is a riding school with a difference, a riding camp. <laughs> Learning the care of horses and how to sit them. From schools like this, the riders graduate to the Gymkhanas, horse and agricultural shows, red letter days in the forest social calendar. A gathering of the clans, these annual shows, a microcosm of the forest world. You run into everybody who is anybody, and into everybody who is glad to be nobody at all. They gather from miles around, all in their different ways, contributing to life as it's known in the new forest. Miss New Forest 1953-54 or any other year, but our homelier favourite, the Carnival Queen. Yes, they know how to enjoy themselves in the New Forest. Varied hunting country this. With the autumn, the buckhounds meet in their splendour. Foxhounds. Autumn and winter is their season as well. Where the forest streams run, there in their element are the amphibious otterhounds. Using their way through the heather, the beagles. Across open country, rough shooting. At the end of the day, something for supper. Change of scene in this panorama of new forest sport and pleasures. The sunny stretches of Bewley River. A grand life. Or is it? The test players, the glory. But there's no cricket like village cricket.
And for those who prefer to take their games a little less strenuously, in the New Forest, another day is nearly over. It's one for the road. The quiet road that takes a man home as the shadows lengthen. Perhaps something of the serenity of this forest heritage touches those who live there. Kind hearts, you will find, and gentle people. No county in the land but offers something peculiarly its own, making up the pattern that is England. Hampshire offers the new forest. <laughs>